see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Uh, hi, it's Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm pleased to have uh, Mark Rosenblum here to uh, chat with. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mark. It's my pleasure. So I wanted to uh, first start off, give a little bit of uh, background about you. Um, you're a professor of history and director of the Center for Jewish Studies at Queens College uh, of the City of the University of New York and director of the Center for Ethic and Racial and Religious Understanding. Um, and they have a short title, C-E-R-R-U.org. Is there a, do you pronounce that, Seru.org? Seru, it's the, cen yes, that's short for C the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding, Seru. And, and it's Seru.org, so anyone can kind of access it. And I can also show, the, I'll show some of this uh, on the screen too. I can show the, the website as, as we talk a little bit later. So um, on the site, it says, uh, Saru inspires a generation of leaders who value cross-cultural engagement, listening, and empathy to inform positive and social change. And uh, so I looked through your website, and all over it says uh, talks about the importance of empathy. And uh, what I'm really looking at is how do we build a culture that's very rich in empathy, uh, basically a culture of empathy. So... Um, First, I thought I'd just hear more about you and, and uh, your program. We can then get in on to uh, the nature of empathy and your work with empathy. Well, I actually started a center that ended up developing courses that were uh, requiring students to engage in a series of exercises and walking in the other side shoes. And since the area that I'm most specialized in as a practitioner and an academic is the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the identities are so central to that conflict, whether it's religious, whether it's national, whether it's ethnic. And I had a strong bent in all of my teaching for all of these years to have the students understand the broad band of sentiments within both Palestine and Israel and not be monochromatic about it and not oversimplify and homogenize the conflict. I wanted the students to understand the, the complexities on both sides and also understand the rich diversity of sentiments on both sides. So it was sort of a Rubik's Cube, if you will, approach to learning where you want to turn and see the multiple angles in a conflict. Uh, and we developed these courses that became fairly popular, got a lot of national attention, and we ended up developing simulations. Uh, so students not only had to walk in the other side's shoes and develop narratives, and I have a series of um, sort of silly little uh, ways of emphasizing particular features of this walk in the other side's shoes. The three little pigs, for example. The children's story about the big bad wolf and the one pig that builds in a house of straw, then a house of wood, and a house of brick. And the students were required to try and develop the most compelling version of the side whose pains and claims they least identified with. And the goal was to not to develop a straw man case, one that was weak and you could blow over, but rather to find the strongest, build the brick house for the other side, because we wanted to really engage the best possible representations of sides that are contested and in a conflict, in this case, quite violent and seemingly intractable one. So these courses that we developed ended up having students not just develop narratives, but they actually had to play a role. And they studied with scholars so that, for example, the Jewish students would study with Muslim and Christian Arab scholars or Palestinian Christian Arab scholars about a moment in history and the Jews and the Jewish students would have to study with Muslim and Christian Arab and Palestinian scholars to study that same moment and the goal was to learn from the other and to reach a certain point where you felt as if you were so strong and clear in your own sides righteousness you could then be prepared to acknowledge you were right enough to acknowledge the wrongs you were engaging in. So we discovered that one of the things that helps get to empathy in some respects is to first 
check yourself and make sure you really have a rather strong and honest appreciation for your own identity, your own camp, as you will. And once you weren't defensive about your own camp and you were sure and confident enough about it, you tended to be willing to make concessions about things you were wrong about, your part in sustaining pain, your, your part in sustaining or starting a conflict. So we developed these simulations where students then had to play roles of the other side in that historical moment. And we ended up also developing not just revisiting past events in the Arab-Israeli conflict with role playing in a simulation, like the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine going to Palestine in 1947 to interview Jews and to interview Palestinians so that the United Nations would have a recommendation of how to somehow move this conflict uh, forward into some kind of mitigation, if not resolution. And the students then played the role of the other in this United Nations Special Committee in 1948. And then we invented a simulation that anticipated the future. So we visited the future and the students tried to make a new future and we simulated a would-be 2013 Israeli-Palestinian negotiation to try and end the conflict. And we studied for six weeks with real Israeli, real Palestinian, real American negotiators. And they learned from them and again it's a crossover connection. The Jewish students study most intensively with the Palestinian Arab negotiators and the Muslims studied mostly with the Jewish and Israeli negotiators and diplomats. And then they engaged in an eight-week simulation and they play a role in it. So we stumbled into this empathy and the things we do in the center regarding reflective listening that you spoke about and how the goal is to get deeper into a dialogue, not to win a debate. And we have all kinds of exercises in patience and patience and not trying to outsmart the other person and think of your comeback, but rather think of how you get go, go deeper into the conversation. And we did this, it turns out, with these simulations. And students revealed certain things we didn't anticipate would help build empathy for them. And then they discovered in these simulations certain moments that were almost purified examples of empathy that had an enormous impact in breaking through a zero-sum conflict. For example, the students themselves came to realize something that wasn't always so clear to me as a scholar when we did one of these simulations and we studied the 1977 Anwar Sadat November visit to Israel and the subsequent speeches and visiting to the Israeli Knesset Parliament in Jerusalem and then going to the Israel Holocaust Museum Yad Vashem. And the students drew out of me, since I was actually with Sadat in Yad Vashem, with, and, and was, happened to be there at a conference at the time, and was given the opportunity to see what he did and the impact that he had. And we had such a remarkable example the students uncovered of an empathetic move where Sadat managed to overrule his entire negotiating team, the entire foreign ministry, all of his advisors in flying to the enemy camp and there shed a tear at Yad Vashem. The Israelis ended up seeing Sadat go from being the greatest fascistic threat to Jews and to Israel to being the great liberator. He became a Moses overnight. And I discovered and remembered my own sister's sharing, who's an Israeli, with her husband, that she said when her first boy was born, his name was David, affectionately Dudu. And when David was born, my sister for the first time acknowledged to her husband that she cried for days while he was out in Miluim, being in the IDF reserves. And she cried and cried. And she never shared with him her loneliness and her fears until Sadat came. And she suddenly felt a safe space enough a new future emerging because of what Sadat did to share with her most intimate connection, her own husband, what her sentiments had been. So the students started to appreciate what Sadat had done. Whatever failures that accompanied the subsequent peace between Egypt and Israel, he 
demonstrated what impact reaching out to another where they are, where they live, the places that are nearest and dearest to them, like Yad Vashem, to just symbolically visit it. So the courses that we teach, not necessarily brilliantly intentional on my part, quite accidental, had students uncovering the significance of empathy, and this became one of the key words, as you noticed, in our, in our, our, our center's self-advertising in the website. Yeah. So as I'm understanding this, you're, you're having the students, uh, if you're having Israeli students uh, kind of take on the role of uh, Palestinians and Palestinian students or gen students, I guess, in general, taking on different roles. And then they really have to study into that role is they're, they're doing a play lot of study. Yes. They're really kind of getting all the literature, all the materials, studying on it. And then you're creating like actual historical environments uh, situations like uh, negotiations or, or what have you and then you bring the students in to do role-playing from that point of view and negotiate from that point of view so they're literally standing in the the uh, role of the other person and having to see the world from their point of view and negotiate uh, from that point of view exactly uh -huh. and the, and the idea is if the simulation is in f in f effective and has an impact the students become quite comfortable in those roles, quite assertive, and shock themselves, and at some point start to wonder, what the heck have they done? Have they decamped? Are they being disloyal to their original ethnic or religious or national identification? It becomes quite fascinating in what you can do in 16 to 32 weeks to get students to actually say, oh my gosh, I really started to believe and feel and get in character and it's a stunning experience for them and it really is a kind of experiential learning we are now trying to and started this past summer for the first time to find not just a place where we can simulate study the other get in the shoes of the other play the role of the other in either a past historical moment or a fabricated designed future moment but we actually now have the, have begun to implement, if ever so slowly, taking this to the actual places. So this past summer, I itinerated a group, a small group of Muslim American, Jewish American, and Christian American scholar students that are all majoring in the Middle East, had some language acquisition of either Hebrew or Arabic or both, and we went to four different countries in the Middle East and had a chance to actually smell the smells, hear the sounds, and re meet with the actual people they were playing. Um, so there's now a field dimension to this, going to the mm. region itself. So you're, you're, you're adding another component, which is it's not just the academic part there in New York at your college. You're actually going into the, into the, situ into the environment itself to add a whole other layer of experiential uh, quality so that the uh, students are really immersing themselves ever deeper and deeper into the the feeling of, of, of these uh, other sides. That's the goal. We've mm -hmm. only had one summer of three weeks this past summer where we really had a chance to take some of the students into the field. And by the way, this isn't just a Queens College event. The goal now is to have other colleges, Penn and Johns Hopkins, were a central part of this past summer. And this next year, we're going to probably open it up to, besides Queens College, to other colleges and students have to and they don't pay a dime we have a, a, a foundation and we have a sponsor that makes all this financially possible mm. so uh, so what has been your experience then with the students are they what are they doing now with that that deeper empathy um, and that deeper understanding what, what kind of what's the next step that they're that they're doing well, the next step is that we have uh, this Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding that tries to find other, if you will, dueling dualities, Pakistani Americans, Indian Americans. Uh, we have conflicts galore uh, on our campus between Greek students and Turkish students. So what we're discovering on a very mixed, diverse college campus of 20,000 students where we have basically 
156 representatives of different nations, and we have nearly 90 languages. I have a class of 25 students now in which 60 languages are spoken. So this diversity we take out of the classroom into a special center where students learn the difficult dialogue and reflective listening and what they might have learned in this course, both in the classroom of Walk in the Other Side Shoes and going actually in the field where the countries of conflict actually exist in the Middle East, they then can come back and talk about other conflicts and understand the concept of due diligence. Instead of being advocates for one side or the other, they first have to get basic information, and the basic information takes them back to, well, what are the ideas I don't know about or know about but don't like? And do I need to master this before I can... You advocate at the end. You don't start as an advocate. And so we have a center that students can go to, um, and they do cultural events. They've discovered that many students are not ready to take a course where they feel as if they're going to have to become the other that they hate. So we find it's too self-selected. The people that end up taking the course are ones that are comfortable in, quote, decamping, but realizing they're not disloyal necessarily. So we look for softer ways, easier, more convenient ways for students through the center of ethnic, racial, religious understanding. So we have musicians, and we have musicians from the Caribbean, from Africa, from Israel, from Palestine, from Pakistan. In fact, we've hired in our campus the most famous Muslim rock star in the world, the founder of a band called Janoon. And Salman Ahmed has wrote, uh, written a, a very powerful, beautiful book about the, the real jihad as he understands it. And so he, we put on musical performances, Common Chords, C-H-O-R-D-S, where students hear musicians talk about where their music is coming from because there are words, there are rhythms, there are values that are part of this. So students can learn empathy and learn about the other, not just through a classroom in history or anthropology or sociology and going to the region in these same areas and exploring. They can enter the realm of culture um, and enter the realm of the performing arts, so much so that the latest course we're currently teaching that takes us back to a course is it's a course that talks about the Israeli-Palestine conflict through the prism of the arts. So we study Israeli and Palestinian playwrights. We have Palestinian and Israeli singers. We have Palestinian and, Is and, and Israelis that are of all different, including the visual arts that come in, and artists. That, that. So we've taken this out of the class also and have these regular programs, and we try and bring their parents in. We try and bring their community in. One of the few benefits of a school like Queens College where 85 to 90 percent of the students are commuters and commuter schools have a reputation is get in as early as you can and leave as early as you can because we have to get back home. We have a job to do. We have families to feed. But we've discovered the one advantage is precisely because 18,000 students go home every night if we're clever enough and disciplined enough, we can take this empathetic learning, this walk in the other side shoes, these programs in music and culture, and enrich the community that the students go back to. They all have high schools they graduate from. They all have community centers and religious institutions. And we try and bring their families in a two-way street relationship between campus and college. So the empathy idea and understanding the other has this kind of geometric growth possibility. Mm. So you you ask so we do get out of the classroom and we're quite anxious to do more and more in the communities around the campus. It's more bang for the buck and the students find it wonderful just to walk in the other side streets. People don't get into other communities. Many people in, in Queens are pretty much in a silo mm -hmm. in a, a particular ethnic group. And so we get students trained in each of their communities to be able to show other people about the food, about the, uh, the religious institutions, the cultural institutions in their own community. So this is another way that we try and get more students who are not comfortable taking a class, but like the idea of going back to their community, getting their parents involved, 
bringing them to the college or bringing the college to their community. They don't have to study a rigorous course. They can do it over food. They can do it over music. They can do it over uh, poetry slams. So these are the sort of things that we've been doing at Queens College. Mm. Well, you know, here at the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, what I'm uh, really looking at is how do we transform society to build, you know, what I call a culture of empathy, which basically means to raise the value of empathy in society. So, for example, you know, you'll ha maybe have the president talking. I remember George Bush mentioned the word, uh, you know, freedom maybe 20 times in his speech. That, you know, to have the president or what have you, you know, throughout the, the, talk about empathy, you know, 20 times in a speech to the Congress or something like that. So it's really how do we change uh, society to raise the level of uh, empathy within society? And so what I'm hearing the way you're approaching it is uh, through role playing, uh, the students are starting to kind of have a culture of empathy is being built within them. They're starting to see the world from other people's uh, perspectives. And uh, then they're also taking it to the next step is they're starting to spread that, spread that to their home communities, to their families. And uh, so it seems like I would say that that's very much a, a culture building uh, project that you have there. One of the goals, and it's starting to at least now, um, I think, being pursued and picked up is to develop something that's replicable. The most important thing here is to not have a standalone case of something that works at a peculiar university. The idea is see if there's a model that can be reproduced that can be done at a university in California or that can go to a college in Massachusetts that's having problems in inter-ethnic conflict. And we're now actually serving as facilitators and we're taking our first this course on walk in the other side shoes and a simulation of an Israeli-Palestine negotiation to colleges. And we're also taking it to synagogues and mosques where rabbis and imams are asking us to design this curriculum for the high school students in those mosques and in those synagogues and churches. So from our vantage point, the idea is to first create a template that works for us and make it simple enough that it's reproduced in other places. So the building of a culture of empathy is to not have something that you enjoy and you think works and keep it to yourself. The idea and, and, to, and to be humble enough and know if we've done this, there must be other people that are doing it and perhaps even better. And to, and to search for those other people that are trying to be creative teachers and learners um, and, and learn from them as well. So one of the things we do every year is we have a capstone program and that capstone program the students have called Uncommon Courage. And they identify one international figure, one alumni of Queens College, and one student already on campus that have engaged in activities and behaviors that are uncommonly courageous. And hear from them. And then at the end of a five-year period, every five years, we would have a whole group of people that were graduates of our program come and talk about how they are seeding the world with this empathy. So the idea is to create a living tree here that grows and people are self-consciously aware of who's gone on this journey with them and they think of themselves as a group that can have an impact, not just as a lonely individual. Now, this sounds more ambitious and together than it actually is. What I'm talking about here is not, we haven't had our first five-year regrouping of all the people that we sent out into the world that graduate from our programs, but this is the goal. Mm -hmm. So you're really looking at making it a bit of a whole movement, the whole replica replicable uh, process that can just keep expanding out there. And it's, uh, uh, so it sounds about this, more of the major focus seems to be conflict resolution, looking for spaces where there's conflict and looking on how to uh, address that. Um, yeah, the students play with what words they think expresses what they're doing best. And my students think of this as cult, uh, and it's now become part of the linguist, the language of this, of conflict transformation. Mm. Um, they don't know that you enter a period of resolution. They don't like the idea, they say, of 
a Hanukkah or a Christmas bow tied on the package and now we're done. This is sort of an ongoing process of, of change and sensitivity building and empathy capacity enlargement. So they see this as sort of like a living orgasm and they find the language of conflict resolution is too endish. It, it culminates oh, as, yeah. at the uh -huh. end. Yeah. Well, that's why I like to turn building a culture of empathy because I've overlapped with the restorative justice community and it's very much around let's just solve the problem and send people back out into the world and it doesn't really address the structural problems within the society that are causing so many conflicts. And one of the problems itself is just a lack of empathy you know, all the way from childhood. People, children don't feel heard, don't feel seen, don't feel uh, understood. And it just kind of goes through the whole, you know, just keeps marching through uh, age after age and these problems just get resolved. So it, to me, it seems that uh, beyond restorative justice, that empathy, a culture of empathy where we really um, foster empathy from the very youngest age and it becomes a, a cultural uh, value and cultural norm is really what's needed in society. Yes, I, I think that one of the the studies that is more and more being validated is in fact with the empathetic move of one party or one group to another it's more likely to lead to a reciprocal act from the other so yes I think this is a, a very important nourishing uh, phenomena that you're talking about and it's, it's critical and that's why the I think the Sadat move was illustrative for our students because the Israelis immediately became empathetic um, and embraced Sadat and talked about what it was a phenomena afterwards, after Sadat died in 19, he was assassinated in 1981, the Israelis came up with a slogan of the post sadatal blues, mm. that they were forever looking for another would-be, quote, Arab that would have this kind of empathetic quality. And, of course, the question becomes, where is the example of the Israeli leader? that had that stark, dramatic initiative that made the first bold step that was so cathartic that the other side felt compelled and safe enough to say, yes, here's my compromise in response. Well, it kind of goes to our political situation that we have the Democrats and, and Republicans kind of battling it out at the national stage, sort of setting the con uh, conflict, the stage for conflict. And... Um, that I've been thinking we need an empathy party movement. So it's, it's like just for a, con like a conflict, it's like you need like a third party that starts with that, has that, that quality that you're mentioning Sadat has. You know, somebody's got to start with starting that chain reaction, that empathic chain of reaction, right? So it's almost like you need to step out of the parties and uh, kind of do some kind of mediation. And um, I, we started doing something like that. We call it the... Uh, restorative empathy circle and we brought in two Republicans and two Democrats to talk about uh, how do we foster empathy between them and uh, so we're just kind of getting started with that so um, that was just kind of one strategy. Yeah I mean one of the difficulties here is you're doing this in terms of a politics that culminates every two or four years into a winner and loser and we're talking about something here that's more transformative and different than that. And to engage as you're doing with Republicans and Democrats that often have embedded ideologues determined to defeat the other, um, not necessarily get into a deeper understanding for the benefit of both. So politics, to some extent, is a very difficult place to make this work unless the people in that political game understand that there is a national winner. There isn't one party that wins and both parties have to somehow uh, establish what are com some common values. We're so far away from that um, and I think that's one of the reasons the American public is so frustrated mm -hmm. because you don't find it easy for these politicians to stop running to win and defeat the other. Well part of it seems to be the uh, social structure. The structure is set up kind of like a fight club. It's set yeah. up our, st our society is set up where there's a, a uh, it's a boxing match and you stick the people in there and you say, you know, be nice. But the whole thing is geared towards fighting. Yeah. And it, we also have, so we have the political system set up as, 
instead of people coming together to dialogue and really uh, hear each other and to that that is what's uh, uh, you know the primary value is the connection the empathic connection uh, so we have the political system we have a justice system that's kind of based on the same competitive model uh, we have an education system based on you know competition for grades and the teachers have to compete for you know to get the grades up and all that so there's a huge amount of unempathic stresses within the whole system so it's like it, it seems like such a big overwhelming job to uh, you know transform that whole system but it's got to start somewhere yes I agree yeah and I kind of see what you're doing I, it, with the college you can kind of educate uh, you know the academic the students and hopefully they'll be able to uh, get out there and kind of make some of those uh, those transformative changes Do you yep. think so? I mean, how are you optimistic on that? Are we going to change? Are we going to change society? I mean, can we turn? Can we build that culture of empathy? You know, how's your uh, your uh, hope level on on that? No, my hope level in terms of what I've seen and what we're doing in a unnecessarily protective environment. It's easier to imagine this happening in the walls of Queens College. Uh, the broader society, it's it's a little bit tougher. But I think there, what we've discovered is so many other people are interested in the same thing. And so there can be a confederation of these things that are taking place. But I think this is also a generational struggle. Uh, and I think that this is, and you have to start young with children as well, as you indicated. Yeah. Well, I think the one part that, you, that you've kind of addressed that uh, spoke to me and, and that uh, I've been trying to work on is this networking. And that's one reason I reached out to you to want to do this interview is just the importance of starting to network with people who have this value of empathy that I'm finding they're kind of very isolated. You know, they're all over. They're, they tend to be kind of isolated. So it's like that that need to uh, bring them together to uh to start this dialogue on how do we foster empathy. Yeah, and I, I'm not, I mean, we also have a particular set of cultural values in this country that are going to have to be realized in terms of the empathy struggle we're engaged in. This, this is a very competitive country, um, and you've talked about that word several times. I don't know that that's something that you need to defeat it's something you need to tame and make sure that it's constructive and not destructive. Um, and too much of what we call competition ends up being hurtful and painful and doesn't let people, don't let people and groups blossom and do common problem solving. Um, so uh, for me, I, I understand there are certain characteristics culturally in the United States that are very, very powerful. And the question is, can you can you take the sharp edges and smooth them out and let a real culture of empathy in, emerge that's consistent with some of the elements in the American political culture? Uh, and I think the smartest kind of empathetic work takes those things into consideration. Uh, and I, I, I suppose that we're, we're talking about models also. I think it would be great for the there being a, a national empathy day and we have a, or a week or a month of empathy week and we try and identify who those people are who have been most successful in working and spreading and defining in meaningful ways what empathy is I mean I think that there's, there, there needs to be some iconic display and some monumental display of the idea of empathy so it doesn't sound like sort of a, a, a word that is used without meaning by people that are touchy-feely. Mm -hmm. This is a very significant word. It's weighted with all kinds of important things. And uh, there ought to be a movement that can make it seem as if it is weighty. It is freighted with important things. And I think that it, part of this is in the American culture. Uh, but I don't think it's been unleashed and packaged and picked up at a national level. And I think that you're you're discovering there are patches of it everywhere. Yeah, it's it's like it, it seems it permeates American society, but it hasn't it doesn't seem like it's been articulated. 
it hasn't been a real clear set of, of vocabulary to really articulate what's going on uh, with empathy and how it works and, and really identifying because there's, there's, you know, for using, I used to, I guess we could talk about the, how your definition of empathy, but, uh, you know, I'm looking at empathy through, I don't know if you've looked into mirror neurons, like how mirror neurons work. They were empathizing all the time. Mm -hmm. And to a varying degree, it's more like how do we turn the dimmer switch up on right. our empathy and uh, and have a, and part of that is a vocabulary to be able to talk about it, too. Yeah, that's why I, I try to focus on the theme of feeling comfortable in your own identification of whoever you are, whether it's religion, whether it's family, whatever it is that is the composite of your sense of who you are. You have to get very comfortable with that and feel as if you're not defensive about who you are in order to be healthy enough to say, I have something to learn. I've done something wrong. Uh, and I think that's why my slogan or the one slogan my students have come up with that I've been very attracted to is that you have to, when, when you feel right enough, you're also willing to acknowledge wrong. When you start thinking about things in terms of uh, refusing to acknowledge your contribution to a destructive mm. process, mm -hmm. you're revealing to me that you're not self-confident in who you are. Um, and so I think we have to build whole people that have a, a clear sense of who they are and they're proud enough of it to also acknowledge their flaws mm -hmm. and to be able to look for other people and understand that we're all imperfect but we're trying to grow something that is better together. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very attached to the acknowledgement of wrong. Um, and that's a very important part of empathy. Mm -hmm. It's really about and, taking responsibility, how my actions affect you. Yes. And uh, understanding that if I do certain things, you're going to have a certain experience and it could be painful. And so I need to... Be aware that, hey, this is hurt, hurting you or, or harming you in some way or, yeah. or, or uh, supporting you or helping, too. Right. Yeah. I think this, is, this happens every day in our program. The things that seem small are central. A student that makes a comment about another student's looks that's destructive and shattering to that person. A person that says something about... Uh, the way you're dressing because of a religious identification and someone makes fun of what you've got on your head. Um, and people are, are, are innocent in making a comment and they don't understand the impact it has on the other person. Uh, and the sensitivity to the perception of the other, even if you don't think that you've done something offensive, to be able to listen to that person who's telling you, I've been hurt. Uh, we have these these are these are daily offenses. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's on a daily basis. There's all kinds of hurts and offenses, and we need some kind of a container to uh, resolve those. You know, some kind of a space to have those dialogues. And it sounds like that's what you're. Yeah, you're safe really creating space is the key to mm -hmm. this. And for example, we have a group of Orthodox Jewish students that have uh, left the day school because they crumbled in the fiscal crisis and parents couldn't afford to send their school kids to private religious day schools. So we had a group of students that came to Queens College that had lived in a, a silo. They had lived in a bubble. They hadn't met other people. And we've developed now six hot-button difficult issues that these students will just learn together as Orthodox Jewish students. And this is very contrary to some of the things that we that we believe in in the center we like to mix and emphasize diversity but here we've discovered building a safe space is the single most important thing we can do where these students are not yet ready to talk openly and honestly about painful things unless they do it with each other and learn from someone who is from their religious uh... background and so we're, we're flexible enough to figure out well, what constitutes a safe place. Some people are not ready for the safe place that others are ready for. And we have to discover what constitutes a safe place for different people.
to have that first honest discussion of empathy and sharing. And it may not be uh, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of a whole spectrum of tools and approaches to, to foster empathy. Like somebody might be able to jump right in, uh, but somebody might need to kind of take a small small step, maybe just starting with empathy. Maybe they didn't even have empathy at home in, in an environment where they were you know, supposed to feel safe and they were kind of repressed or whatever. So it's a lot of uh, um, rebuilding, empathic building, rebuilding their tr developing trust. And, you know, how is uh, your definition? What is your kind of working definition? How are you using the word empathy? Do you have like a basic definition that you're operating well, I from? Think, I think the students have long and uh, rather unresolved definitions about what empathy means to them and what constitutes empathetic behavior. Uh, so I, I think we have not arrived at, and the students in fact find that unhelpful the same way they, they don't like the language and to be described as engaged in conflict resolution. They think empathy has some minimum things, sensitivity to somebody else's feelings, uh, obviously is important to put, be able to put yourself in the other side's position is absolutely critical um, and that's why so many of our structural courses and exercises involve this walking the other side's shoes without your ability to uh, imagine and then go through an exercise where you do things you find on a college campus uh, where you find students walking around with little white sticks that are are being asked to uh, see what it feels like to be sightless and, and get inside of somebody else's uh, limitation and restraint and see what impact it, it has on, on your own thinking and behavior. So I, I, th I think that this, again, is not one size fits all, but it is a question of minimally the will and the capacity to, to imagine what the other is experiencing. Well, I, you know, I've been looking at this for some time now and been talking with, you know, the academics and, you know, a wide variety of people around empathy and, you know, people like um, Paul Ekman, who has written about facial recognition and all that. When I interviewed him, he said, oh, it's a morass with the definition of empathy and like Dan Batson, who's kind of studied empathy. And he, he's laid out eight different ways that the word is used by different uh, academics, etc., so there is a, a bit of uh, uh, lack of clarity, and um, some people, you know, really complain about that lack of specificity about, you know, what is what do we really mean by empathy? Um, and I've put together a little bit of a definition, which perhaps I could just uh, run yeah. by you quickly. And I've seen uh, empathy is sort of like four parts to it. That the first part is uh, self-empathy. So that's really sensory awareness, mindfulness to what's going on inside myself. You know, it's mindfulness, you know, the arts, uh, yoga, all those different things really tune you into reading the feelings that are going on inside of yourself. And that's, you kind of need to start there um, to just be able to read your own emotions. The second part is uh, mirrored empathy, and that's through mirror neurons. So as, as you see my hands waving here, you know, your neurons are firing in your brain as if, if you're waving your hands. And, you know, I see you, you know, nodding and, you know, I, I can feel that nodding uh, within myself through, so that through this reflective uh, synchronization that kind of happens through mirror neurons. The third part I would call imaginative empathy and the academics call it cognitive or perspective taking, which is really, I think, the area that you're really focused on is to really put yourself uh, into the shoes of the other person, to really imagine what it's like to be in their situation, uh, so taking their perspective. And the fourth part would be uh, empathic action, or maybe even uh, be a term I'm liking as empathic creativity, is that when we really have that resonance and that understanding of someone else, that we almost like become... Uh, we come, we see our common humanity. We really see the commonness that we have between each other, and how we're really kind of just feeling the same, you know, the same things, and that we want to contribute to people's well-being. And we just think 
uh, creatively of how to kind of problem solve uh, together. And uh, so I would call that empathic creativity or empathic action. So that's kind of the basic uh, model I've put together from a lot of different, uh, you know, things I've heard about empathy. I'm just wondering how that resonates with Well, there are your... three things in that empathy that I think we are, with slightly different words, very conscious of as part of our, our program and our educational model. The first one I, I talked about in terms of a strong or clear identity, but has a, a, a bolder and broader characterization that you just made. It has to do with with not just uh, your identity, it has to do with your body. It has to do, so I think it starts with, with a sense of self-knowledge and self-realization. Uh, Maybe uh, that self-empathy then, that kind of yes, matches that's, up that's against the, that match. Yeah, uh -huh. That's the first thing. And the other one, again, you're identified is the, is the sense of imagining and experiencing what, it, what it's like for another and to have that kind of empathy for the other. And then the last of the, of the three things that you mentioned, the very last is something we're very self-conscious of that we're doing as well. Of, of our work, those are the three that I think are, are most clearly fitting into our mission and what our students feel as if they're trying to master and to, and to take into the world in an action-oriented way, to do something about these things that they've learned in, in manifesting in terms of shared activity with other human beings. Um, but that's, that's the advocation or action that comes at the end for them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the part that it's that mirrored empathy, I think, is an important uh, part, too. And that's what we've been, we have something called empathy circles that we're start, starting up. Maybe we can talk yep. about that at some point. It's small group discussions about how do we build a culture of empathy and we, we start off actually with physical synchronization or mirroring. You know, you tap into a feeling that you have, and then you kind of turn it into a physical motion, and then everyone mirrors it. So that you're kind of practicing that reflective mirroring kind of quality. And, uh, you know, people like Franz Duwal, um, have, have, he talks about really about that synchronization being this foundational kind of building block of, of empathy. No, I think that I think there is something to that as well. Yeah, I was just trying to be honest in terms of the things that uh, our students in our program of the five themes you laid out there that are sort of the your working definition and understanding. Those were the and but the the ref, the reflector. It's also I think operational. Mm -hmm. I can see it in some of the things that we do. Well, one of the def around definitions, it's, it's uh, standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. So there's that metaphorical way of describing empathy. I was wondering if you have a metaphor for empathy, like your own. You can't use one of those because they're already taken. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my metaphor for empathy is like a cornucopia, that, um, that when I can empathize with others, it's like it opens my world you know, to experience. So I'm like getting all these different experiences, uh, just like an emotional cornucopia. So I'm just giving, just to kind of give you some ideas that maybe so if anything comes to mind for you. No, I mean, I think that, I think I've, I've uh, for me, it, it gets back to some of the, uh, the sense of a, of a garden and bloomage. Um, and sort of the, the watering and the nourishment and the sense of who is the gardener here. And at some point, the students understand they're, they're all the gardener. Mm. And, and they, 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 like, they like the combination of the flowers and the things they see. And when they get into one of their discussions where they have 50, 75 students being trained in this reflective listening and deep dialogue, you can actually hear when there is a buzz and the students can get this, this the, what you're characterizing as mirroring and the students picture this as a, a garden and they, can, and they can actually feel themselves being nourished and growing. And, and the gardener is the process that we brought all of them together. Um, and who brought us together? Well, everyone who came made the decision to come and to try and not win a discussion, 
but get deeper into the discussion. And they find that, I, I suppose that's not the metaphor you're looking for, but that's the process that I, I, I feel most of the students have identified as the meaningfulness of this. Well, that sounds like a metaphor to me, a, a garden that, and, and you know, it, when you're empathic, you're kind of like tending the garden too, right? I mean, you're, you're nourishing other people and uh, you're being nourished as well. So I like- And other people that came and were not sure when they came in exactly what to expect and find it's safe and they suddenly start to let their guard down and they suddenly began to talk honestly and they know they're not allowed to make a judgment yet they're asked to sustain this conversation and be able to then summarize what happened that demonstrates they were listening to the other, not thinking ahead about what they were going to say to outsmart. And the students end up, you can, you can feel them, gee, this is, this is working. And then they try it at home with their mother, uh, who they're having a terrible discussion with in a fight that's been going on for a month. And they, they then tell their and they just try and have a reflective listening episode trying to understand their mother and they come back and they say this is a, a little little gem of a <laughs> uh-huh yeah that's beautiful well mark this has been a wonderful uh, conversation i'm so glad that uh, we got to uh, uh connect on this and you know hear about your program and talk about empathy and talk about how we can build a culture of empathy uh so i hope we can keep the conversation going and maybe swap some uh you know, empathy strategy ideas in the future and kind of I'm keep the... I forward to that. Yeah. I empathize great. with that idea. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. My and uh, pleasure. Thank you for initiating this. Mm -hmm. Take okay. care. Bye, Mark. Bye-bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.